Okay, so we wanted to connect with you because we heard about the DHR internship commencement and we saw your speech. So if you would like, you could tell us a little bit about that program and what you were doing at that commencement ceremony. So we started that program. It's called the Junior Clinical Research Internship Program uh, last, uh, uh, last year with a very small uh, cohort of uh, students. The idea was that can we bring the students in and A, expose them to the various disciplines of medicine that uh, we practice here at DHR to keep their interest uh, alive as far as uh, going into medical field, but more importantly, to create uh, a cohort of critical thinkers, individuals who would uh, ask the question why, and uh, would always be inquisitive and uh, do research uh, in the area of, uh, of medicine. The third was to actually, uh, objective was to uh, give them, uh, make them aware of the public health crisis that is going on in the Valley, uh, particularly in diseases such as obesity and diabetes and cardiovascular disorders and liver diseases and cancer. Because everything that we, um, every disease that we can think of is actually, actually in double digits in the valley. So those were the three primary objectives uh, for this. So we started this last year with about 12 students um, as a pilot study to see if how this is going to shape up. And very quickly we realized that this would be an enormous, uh, uh, it would have an enormous impact on the community. So we decided that we will expand it. Uh, initially the expansion was supposed to be to 100 students. But very quickly, we actually made a decision to expand it to 200 students uh, for this summer. So the students were selected from um, 24 different uh, independent school districts. Uh, we partnered with Region 1 with their PATH program and also with their GERA program. And so we brought, uh, we divided this up into four different sessions with 50 students in each session. It was a very intensive program. It was offered at the college level. And we made it very clear to the students when they came in that uh, this is not a walk in the park. This is not any other summer uh, program that you may have gone through previously. Uh, you would be uh, expected to raise your standard. We would not lower ours. And uh, that there was a requirement that um, the, after a requirement for completion was that they would also uh, write uh, a manuscript, which is going to be uh, mentored by um, staff from the research institute. And so, um, and there were, were a lot of immersion exercises, hands-on exercises that were there. So when we gave a, for example, a lecture on liver diseases, we followed this with a um, uh, hands-on exercise related to how do you actually diagnose a liver disease? What is a fibro scan? How can, how do you, what does the liver look like under a fibro scan? When we were talking about infectious diseases, we then took them and they did an experiment uh, where they actually did their uh, testing for COVID and uh, how does the, uh, the, uh, uh, the antigen test for COVID is done. So everything that we did had a meaningful uh, hands-on uh, exercise so, so that we can reinforce the information that we have given them uh, verbally. It was a, a interactive uh, uh, program where we actually, if I, for example, gave a talk on, um, on um, immunodeficiencies and immune problems, we actually had a lot of uh, uh, individuals in the room who either themselves or their families were having some sort of an immune disorder. So they would actually come up in front of the students and um, make a presentation about what their, uh, what their experience has been. When I talked about COVID, literally everyone in the room raised their hand that they know someone who had COVID. Well, we selected a, a group of individuals to come and talk about COVID. What happened with them when they had COVID? How did they acquire COVID? Uh, what did they do when they actually were infected? So, it was a very interactive session instead of us standing in front of them and talking about in detail as to what is COVID and how do you acquire COVID and what you, how you can prevent it. Let the students talk to the students, let the teachers talk to the teachers. And I think that was the, uh, uh, a very important aspect of this particular program. 
And you mentioned in this um, this commencement speech a public health crisis. Um, what is the public health crisis in the context of the U.S.? Yeah. So I think people, when we you talk right now about public health crisis, they actually immediately uh, pivot towards uh, COVID nineteen. COVID-19 is a transactional public health crisis. It's going to come and go. And uh, that is not the public health crisis that we are interested in trying to um, uh, mitigate. The public health crisis that actually has um, engulfed the entire nation is obesity. It's diabetes, it's cardiovascular disorders, it's uh, um, liver diseases. And I'm not talking about alcoholic liver diseases. I'm talking about non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, which ultimately leads to liver cirrhosis and liver cancers. And then the very high incidence of cancers. We see a lot of people with stroke, uh, strokes in this particular part of the region, but also that is true across the entire United States. So I think if you take all of these diseases together, we are facing a catastrophe. And that is what the intent of this particular uh, summer program was, how to make them aware of these public health crises. And there are tools available to actually mitigate them. Some are research and some are just behavioral changes and environmental changes. So we wanted to actually um, impress upon the students to be the ambassadors to actually take this word out and let people know that there are tools and resources available to we also talked about mental health, and uh, which is a, another major crisis, uh, an unspoken major crisis. If you go and talk to people who have mental health disorders in their own family, there is an absolute denial. And this denial happens to be more uh, prevalent in people with, of, of Hispanic ethnicity. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think we, those were the things that we talked about. And how have these so the U.S. has these public health problems. How do they? How do you think they trickle down into the Rio Grande Valley? And do you think these problems are exacerbated in the Rio Grande Valley? They are exacerbated in the Rio Grande Valley because of the following reasons. One, um, the people are. Um, this is a medically underserved region. Okay, so there are more individuals and less physicians and providers in this particular region. Number two. A lot of people are uninsured. That actually aggravates the problem. Number three, our um, uh, so certain habits in this particular part of the world, uh, such as, uh, uh, I just wanna make sure that I turn this off. I'm sorry. It's all good. Yeah. And the third is that we actually have a certain, um, uh, uh, our diet in this particular part of the valley is, is also something that uh, we need to seriously reconsider. And last but not the least, um, and this is uh, a reflection across the entire Latin world, um, people with Hispanic ethnicity seek uh, medical care at the last juncture. They don't go early on, they don't go for their regular checkups, they don't go for their physicals on a regular basis. And they actually, there's a lot of denial that I don't have this disease or that I don't have this problem. And that basically ex exacerbates the situation. Those are all very good points. And do you think that, what, what do you think could be done to change our situation in the Valley? Expansion of Medicaid, um, more outreach programs? I think there has to be expansion of Medicaid. Uh, that's not, not, that's, uh, um, not an issue. The, I think there needs to be a lot of uh, outreach programs. Uh, most of what we are doing, and that is what we are changing at DHR, is that we treat you when you come and, and you are sick. What we need to do is, and that is what our focus at DHR has been, and that is what this summer program and more, and all the other programs that we are putting together is how can we um, prevent you from even getting sick? How can we keep you healthy? How can we make sure that your eating habits, your environmental habits are actually in line with uh, ensuring that you have a, a normal, healthy life? And that is what the focus is. 
And have you encountered any barriers in the Rio Grande Valley, maybe language barriers or undocumented people who don't want to seek care? So um, as far as the language barrier is concerned, we have uh, interpreters. We have a um, majority of the people who work at DHR and who were part of this particular program are actually uh, dual language speakers. They are very comfortable. They are locals. They were grown up and raised here. They, many of them are of, uh, of uh, Hispanic ethnicity. So I think la language barrier is not a problem. The issue obviously is uh, outreach. Can we reach uh, to um, a larger cohort of individuals out there? And we feel that these students actually have a very um, prominent and a role to play in their households. They have an influence that is going to be extremely important. People would listen to them. So we are working on, on going to bingo parties and the colonias and to uh, 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 malls and talking to people about uh, healthy living habits. Uh, but at the same time, we are also working to, if with these students and we would now be starting to work with middle uh, students in the middle school so that we can start to um, shape their understanding of what the healthcare crisis is out there. And that's all very important. Um, so you think that the, you know, mentioned that the students were born and raised here, they know the language. Do you think that their fam um, familiarity with the culture the language, the customs, do you think that will really help in the communities trusting them um, or listening to them? Yes, I am absolutely certain. That was one of the uh, predominant uh, motivation to actually uh, start this program of how can we actually uh, educate and give all the uh, tools and the uh, information to these high school students, to the middle school students because uh, they actually have uh, some influence in their household. Among their peers, uh, they may have influence. So absolutely, they would be a great resource for us. I can tell you that we now have 200 plus ambassadors out there talking about public health crisis. And is there anything else that you would like to add um, to say to the public about this crisis or about the program? The only thing I would say, I would add, uh, is that uh, this program is not meant to actually um, prepare the student to go or prepare these uh, kids to go into um, health sciences. That was not the motivation of this program. That is one of the uh, many objectives of this program. The principal objective was to make uh, create critical thinkers, individuals who actually take information and critically analyze it and, and make sure that that particular information is accurate and factual before they act. And that was the biggest uh, motivation for setting up this particular program. And have you seen a change in, I don't know if you interacted with students before versus after the program, did you notice a change in their thinking or their perspectives? Yes, so we actually uh, did a survey before and a survey after the program. Uh, for each of these sessions. So we had four sessions and we are meeting tomorrow with region one to get their feedback, uh, in, in person feedback about the program because they have heard back from their counselors and their facilitators and teachers of what the students have come back and told them about the program. So uh, the answer is absolutely. I can tell you that one of the students, parents came to me and said that my child is transformed. I have never seen this particular child get up uh, without being uh, harassed in the morning. And now this particular child doesn't even set up a alarm clock to get up at uh, and to attend this particular session. I have, students have walked up to us and said, what are we going to do uh, for the rest of the summer? So I think there has been a, a major transformation in the way they think, in the way they behave, and in the way they I feel how important and valuable their contribution to this particular community is. That's amazing. Um, and this program sounds exactly like what the Valley needs right now. Yeah, and we are hoping to expand it mm -hmm. um, to about 400 students next year. 
Now, bear in mind, these students will be coming back to us three times from now until uh, June of next year. And those are wraparounds. So we will continue to impress upon them the need for, their, for, for, their, for them to gain more knowledge, to gain more experience, to gain more tools, and also to prepare them for their next, uh, 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 next part of their career, which is uh, applying to the colleges, putting their personal uh, statement together, uh, seeking help for putting their uh, uh, CV together or resume together, interview skills, all that is going to be part of the wraparound program. That's great. So it'll help both them and it'll help the community. That's great. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, I believe that's everything. Um, I want to thank you so much for your time. My pleasure. And, um, but off 